Alex, you're live. Hi, everybody. We had a little bit of a glitch. Apparently, the stream didn't want to start today, coming all the way up from Australia with Terry working the stream. But we figured it out, and we've got it going. So I uh, hope everybody's having a good time in this nice wintry weather we've been having and things like that. So good to see you all out there tonight. Um, got some interesting things to show you because we've got some real interesting things coming up on the calendar. Um, and so let's go over to there. And Molly's not with us tonight. She's out uh, doing some research for her project, but the rest of us are here. I want to go to the calendar to start with. Um, tonight we got Craig here. Craig is going to tell us about non-destructive color mapping in Photoshop. And then Matt is going to um, come in next week and tell us about some things he's been doing, working with a whole lot of people with astroimaging and stuff like that. Now, we're going to take a, a weekend off on February 6th because it's Super Bowl. And then we've got lots of other things coming up. You might notice, or maybe you don't notice, that we're scheduled all the way through May. And what's really cool about that is that we're getting scheduled by people volunteering to schedule. And... That's nice because that's the way it's supposed to work. This is your program. It's something you guys get to do. The more of you that have ideas that think that other people will need to learn a little bit about it, the more of you that volunteer by pressing on um, the um, uh, contact button up here and just tell us your first name, your last name, tell us what you want to do. We'll talk to you a little bit about it and we'll talk about scheduling you up. There's a Sunday, like pretty near every week, there is a Sunday, so uh, there are plenty of places to schedule you. Um, but there are two things on the schedule that you do need to know about because you have to get to work and do something about them. And the first of them is coming up uh, on March 27th. Uh, Rory has organized another TAIC workshop. And Terry's data is out there, and we'll tell you about that in a minute. Also, Tim is going to come along, and he's going to tell us about process and image containers for about 20 minutes. And then Eric's going to come in and tell us about high pass filtering in Photoshop. And, um, you know, he was talking before the show about how much, how important that is to get in a good picture. The other thing that we've got to talk about is TAIC shots. Rory's been doing that. Arno, excuse me, has been doing the uh, TAIC workshop. And Rory's been organizing the TAIC shots um, on the solar system this time. Let's go over to the shots page first. And we don't have any, um, um, no, this is, the, yeah, the shots page. This is where Arno is waiting for you guys to send in pictures of the solar system. And you've got until April 3rd to get them in here. And then he'll put them together over the next couple of weeks and make a movie out of it. If you want to see what the other movies look like, they're all on the web page here. Okay, so you can go in and, and, and uh, do that. You just click here to submit, and you just send us a JPEG or a PNG of about 10, 1080 picture, pixels on each side. If you made a movie of the solar system, where well, you can include that. Not too long, not too long. You know, we've, we, we hope that these things come in at about, oh, 10 to 12 minutes. And if everybody turns in a big, long movie, it takes a long time. Um, the other thing I want to tell you about is the workshop. And the workshop, we've done it before. You've seen it many times. Um, we've had workshops on Eric Cole's data, Steve Miller's, Alex McConaughey did a couple of them, Eric Cole's again. Uh, we give you the data and you uh, work on it as well as you can and then you submit it to us. Terry's down in Australia and he submitted a bunch of really cool data, lots of different files. You don't have to use all the files he sent you. You can choose among the LRGB, luminance, well, luminance RGB, uh, and various narrow bands for it. So um, uh, again, you submit a, a, a JPEG or an MPG of 1080 pixels on one side, big enough so that we can see it, but it doesn't have to be a full-blown you know, XISF file or anything like that, just enough for us to see it. And um, then Rory will be getting in touch with some of you and put together a show. You remember the last time we did this with who was it, Sarek's data? Uh, we got all these different interpretations of the same data. So it's really interesting to watch how people can get different things out of it. So I've talked about all the things I need to talk about except for one thing. You'll notice over here that on the YouTube page, we've got a section over here 
for everybody to, to chat. And so we hope that you're chat, chatting away. Remember, this is kind of your club, particularly in an age of COVID. You can visit with people from all over the world and there's all sorts of things you can say. Up at the very top, you'll notice on my screen, I don't know where it is on your screen, uh, utahdesertremote.com is a link to Craig's work. Craig wanted us to know about that because he's got a lot of stuff to say and he wanted you to have access to the rest of his work in case, um, uh, in case he didn't get it all in tonight. So anyway, that's his link. Be sure to put your comments in here. If you've got a question, put a question mark in there and we'll be able to, to see it. Uh, there's other things you can do. One of the things we haven't been emphasizing lately is um, be sure that you um, uh, subscribe and you like the programs because it makes us feel good for one thing. But um, subscribing also gets you connected to us so that uh, you'll know when we're having programs and things like that. Okay, so please do that. And uh, then I suppose it's time for the big show. And the big show includes um, Craig and Craig Stocks is gonna tell us about color mapping. Craig, you ready to go? I am ready to go. Okay, take over. Here comes so, Ray. So you should be seeing my screen now? Yep, we've got the three pictures. Okay, great. Well, this is Photoshop for astrophotographers. And basically, I'm going to go over kind of three things. Just very briefly, I'm going to talk about my workflow, uh, just so you understand how I got to, to the Photoshop steps in the first place. Uh, I'll describe briefly how I do stacking and stretching. Uh, but most of the evening is going to be spent talking about Photoshop processes. So just a brief history of me. Uh, I started in photography uh, in the early 1970s uh, as a news and portrait photographer. I did that for several years and eventually realized that's not a good way to make a living. So I switched to mechanical engineering and retired in 2008. Uh, but I did begin playing with digital imaging as far back as the mid-1990s. So now I basically play with cameras and telescopes full time. Uh, I define myself as a fine art photographer. And I, what that means is my primary motivation is the aesthetics of the image. Uh, in other words, a pretty picture is more important to me than scientific accuracy. And I am very new at astro imaging, uh, but I am very familiar with Photoshop. Uh, I have really, I guess, two missions in life now. One is to present astrophotography as a form of fine art. And the second is to promote a layer-based, non-destructive workflow when using Photoshop. And I know there's lots of ways to approach astro uh, post-processing. And if the way you're doing it is working for you, that's fine. I'm not trying to convince anybody to switch to Photoshop. But for those of you who do use Photoshop, uh, I'm hoping I can share some things that may make it easier for you. I do most of my imaging at a remote observatory operation in Southwest Utah. It's a Bortle II at about 5,100 feet of elevation. So that puts it about 60 miles north and about 2,000 feet higher in elevation than where I live. And the website there, if you want more information, is utahdesertremote.com. And I think Alex mentioned in the blog section, I have some additional videos and more information from what I'm covering tonight. Imaging hardware, I basically have two uh, setups that I alternate right now. I have the Takahashi FSQ-106 on a Paramount MX Plus mount uh, with an ASI 6200mm Pro monochrome camera uh, with a filter wheel with a, you know, the usual assortment of filters and an Orion Mini guide scope. Here in the next several weeks, I'll be switching over to the Plane Wave CDK 12.5 on a Paramount ME2 mount, again with a ASI 6200 camera filter wheel. And in this case, I'm using a, a William Optics Zenith Star 81 as the guide scope. <clears throat> I use Voyager for my overall uh, process and uh, session control from startup to shutdown, uh, and the SkyX for auto guiding and mount control. 
and I have Dropbox uh, just kind of automatically transferring the image files as they're created so they show up on my computer at home. My typical workflow is I kind of watch the weather, uh, configure a script in Voyager, uh, open the observatory, launch the programs, go to bed. And when I get up in the morning, I close the observatory and copy files from the Dropbox folder onto a permanent folder on my uh, computer. My typical imaging sequence, uh, if I'm shooting narrow band, I'll shoot uh, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen for you know, 600 to 1200 seconds. But I also incorporate RGB for usually 120 seconds specifically to capture the stars. If I'm shooting specifically RGB, I'll run those, you know, two to five minutes, uh, and usually we'll pick up some hydrogen alpha also. I include darks from a library. I'll shoot flats, either flip flats or sky flats in the morning if I feel they're needed for the target. Uh, but I'm not very patient, so I will say I tend to process my images with too little data, but what I lack in patience, I make up in uh, persistence. And so I will keep going back to a target till I feel like I get it right. And that kind of leads to my processing workflow. I generally will stack the lights, calibration frames and so forth in Deep Sky Stacker. And from that, I will save those stacked files as 32-bit FITS files, a little bit unusual perhaps. Uh, but then I also uh, will use the autosave files that DSS generates. I'll take those FITS files that I saved into a program called FITS Liberator that I don't hear much about, uh, but it has some great stretching algorithms. And I'll use it generally to do an arc sine h stretch on the, um, especially the narrow band data, and then save that as a 16-bit TIFF. And then in Photoshop, uh, I will use equalize histogram or some other method to convert the 32-bit into 16 bits. And I also have been using Mark Shelley's uh, arc sine h stretch method. Uh, the link to his website is rather long. Uh, I also have that link in the blog on my website, so you can go there and click right on it. But uh, as I understand it, he developed the arc sine h stretch method in PixInsight, and then he adopted that into Photoshop. And that's usually where I go then with all those different files, uh, combine those into Photoshop to color map, tune, tone, uh, do whatever needs to be done, reduce stars. And generally I will save it as a .psb, which is Photoshop's native large format uh, file. And the advantage of that is there's, there are limits, but it's almost limitless in terms of the size of the file it can handle. And it's only after I have that master file, I'll generally take it someplace like Lightroom and do my final cropping rotations. And from there, I would either export it to a JPEG or open it as a PSD to print. Throughout this, I use a layer-based non-destructive workflow. Uh, the advantage of a non-destructive workflow is that you maintain layers and adjustment layers intact, uh, even when you save the file so that any change I make, I can undo or redo later if I change my mind on something or if I've taken something too far, I can back it off or if it's not far enough, I can go forward. Uh, or if I get uh, two hours into processing and I discover a satellite trail that I didn't notice earlier, I can go back to that original file, correct the satellite trail and then pick up where I left off. Generally, I don't care about file size. Um, the .psb file format will support large files, uh, but I'm not running on a special state-of-the-art computer either. This is a, a five-year-old laptop with 32 gig of RAM. Uh, so it's, it was an okay laptop in its day, but it is five years old. But I almost never flatten a file or merge layers. Speaking of layers, layers are really the fundamental building blocks of a document in Photoshop. And the way this is laid out, I have my layers palette in the lower right hand side. And if we zoom in on that, you can see this particular document has three layers. It has Orion blue, Orion green, and Orion red. So that would kind of imply to us that these are probably the red, green, and blue um, files from a monochrome camera. Just like hydrogen is kind of what the 
universe is built from, from hydrogen and things you can make from hydrogen. Uh, Photoshop documents are built from layers and things you can build from layers. It's similar to a stack of paper, and generally the one that you see is the one that's on top. But Photoshop does have some really nice tools to allow layers to interact with one another. There's two types of layers. There are pixel bearing layers and there are adjustment layers. A pixel bearing layer is just that. That's your image, your photo. Um, each pixel has a red, green, and blue value. And of course, it's the mix of red, green, and blue that makes color. Layers are normally opaque. And the thing we want to avoid is doing anything that would directly change the values of the pixels on a pixel bearing layer. That includes things like a clone stamp or uh, levels adjustments, curves adjustments, things like that, that calculate and replace the RGB value with new values. That's what we use adjustment layers for. An adjustment layer doesn't contain any pixels. It just adjusts the view that you're looking at below the adjustment layer. So it's, it's a bit like looking through glasses at the layers below the adjustment layer. The beauty is that it's saved with the document so that the document retains all of those settings. And it's really the keystone of a non-destructive workflow. Common adjustment layers are things like levels, curves, color balance, hue, saturation, selective color, and so forth. And the important thing is they don't change the pixel. They only change the look of the pixel. And we can look at that in just a real brief example. So here's a, an image in Photoshop. And if I just go to layer, let me zoom in here so you can see it better. Go to layer. Sorry, image, adjustments, levels. And that will present the adjustment dialog. If I decide I want to make this darker by darkening the the blacks and maybe even darkening the midtones a little bit. And click OK. That has actually changed the pixels on this image. So if I try to go back to a levels adjustment and undo what I just did, I will never get back what I started with because I have changed those pixels and you just can't change them and change them back and always get back where you started. It's a bit like making a, a copy of a copy of a copy. So if instead we step back in time and instead of using an adjustment, if we use an adjustment layer, and you can get those through the, the layers palette, but the easiest way is in the adjustments panel. It gives you little icons for the common adjustment layers and we'll pick the levels adjustment layer. And it actually adds a new layer to the document with the controls in the properties panel. And here I can make those changes and I could save this document, go eat supper, come back a year from now, reopen it. And this layer with those settings are saved. So I can change my mind and undo something and do something different than what I did before and not lose anything. That's really kind of the the fundamental part of an adjustment layer. So let's pop back into the presentation. And hopefully pick up where we left off. There we go. Because we're going to use layers and files so often and we want to make layers from files, for instance, the red, green, and blue, or hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen, we'll use a script that comes free with Photoshop. It's already installed and you just have to go to the file menu and under scripts, there is an option called load files into stack. What that really does is load the files into a layer so that each file comes in on its own layer and then it builds that document for you and you don't have to cut, copy, paste, and so forth to move from, from document to document. Every layer and every adjustment layer can also have a mask. Adjustment layers come with a mask automatically. Others, you may have to add the mask. A mask basically hides a layer or its effect. And black on a mask hides that layer 
white on a mask reveals that layer or the effect of that layer. So rather than erasing pixels off of a layer, you can simply hide it with a mask. And like an adjustment layer, masks are stored with an intact document. So you can come back later. And if you have erased something and you erased too much by painting black on a mask, all you have to do is paint white on the mask and you can restore what had been hidden. So masks are reversible. You've probably heard talk about color channels, and I just want to differentiate quickly between a grayscale image and a monochrome image. A grayscale image only has one channel, and that's gray, where an RGB color image has all three, red, green, and blue. And obviously, each layer contains all of the red, green, and blue channels or values for each pixel. Anytime red, green, and blue are all equal, the result is neutral, in other words, no color. So 000, zero, zero is black, uh, all 255s would be white, anything in between would be some version of gray. So an RGB monochrome image can be black and white, it just has red, green, and blue values that are equal throughout the image. The way you adjust those image modes is with the image mode menu option. And when you look at it, you'll see a little flyout menu and it will show you options like grayscale and RGB color. It'll also show you options for bit depth where the two most common you're gonna run across are 32-bit and 16-bit. In general, we wanna get our files into a 16-bit RGB color in order to have all of the tools available within Photoshop. And you do that just by accessing this menu option and selecting RGB color if it's a grayscale image. I'll use a couple of keyboard shortcuts. I'm not big on keyboard shortcuts, but some of the real common tools are V for the move tool, B for the brush tool if you're going to paint on a mask. And when you're using the brush tool, you can tap D to make sure you have the default, which are typically white and black foreground and background colors. X will quickly swap between foreground and background colors and the left and right bracket keys will make the brush larger or smaller. Control J will copy a layer. Control G will group layers into a group. Shift Control U will desaturate a layer. And there's really not a, anything other than a keyboard shortcut for this one, I believe, and that's the Shift Control Alternate E, which is kind of just the whole left side of the keyboard. What that does is merge all visible into one new layer. You'll sometimes hear it called stamp visible or stamp a new layer. So with that as a background, let's look at the shortcut to the magic. And what we want to do is take our red, green, and blue individual files and magically transform those into a color image. So we'll go back to Photoshop. And because those are three individual files, I want to go to scripts, load files into stack. And from there, I can browse. And it will give me the dialog to navigate to the folder where those files are stored. And they're stored hopefully right in this folder. I can click on one, shift click at the other end to select all three, click OK. And that will show me that list. Click OK on the dialog box. And now Photoshop will create a new document with those three files loaded as individual layers in one Photoshop document. <clears throat> and that lets us start our layer-based non-destructive workflow. And you can see Photoshop doing its work, loading the files over here in the layers panel. And I like to keep myself organized. It's not necessary to do this, but I find it, it helps me. I always like to put red on the bottom, green in the middle, and blue on the top. Sometimes they'll come in in that order, sometimes they don't. Even if I load the same files again, they may come in in a little bit different order. But fortunately, this time it loaded red, green, and blue. So the first thing I wanna look at is my image mode and this is a grayscale document. So there's no color information. I'll just select RGB color, and we've now converted this into a color image 
you will get this little pop-up dialog asking if you want to merge the layers. Obviously, we don't. We just loaded them as separate layers, so don't merge. And sometimes you may see a little change in the image. Sometimes you won't. Uh, but now we have red, green, and blue all stacked up here. And the important thing is each one of these layers has red, green, and blue data. It's just that when it's all used, the image appears monochrome. But there's a secret. And the long way to get to it is to go to layer, layer style, blending options. And this will bring up a dialog box that shows us what Photoshop calls the advanced blending options. It's the, if it's not on the correct one, it's the, the first one where it says blending options. The magical part, if you look in the center of blending options, you'll see the three channels listed, RGB, and a check mark next to each one. Well, this top layer is blue. We want it to only be blue. Let's just turn off red and green. And there's the blue. And it looks like at some point I accidentally moved it, but. We'll just forge ahead. We'll go to the green channel and we'll do the same thing. We'll go to layer, layer style, blending options. And you're probably already guessing this one will also have red, green, and blue listed. And we'll simply turn off the red and blue because this is our green layer. And just like that, we have a color image. So that's kind of the, the first step in the magic of a layer-based workflow. And we're done with this, so I'm going to close it. And we will go back to the presentation. Now, if that's all I was going to show you, that would be maybe a little bit of a parlor trick. But let's take that technique and put it into an overall workflow. Layers can also go into layer groups, and they help you keep organized, among other things. So in this example, I've now taken those three layers, red, green, and blue, and I put each one into its own group. <clears throat> so we have a red group, a green group, and a blue group. Now we can add adjustment layers. And the beauty of adding an adjustment layer within a group is what happens in the group stays in the group. So if I adjust this levels adjustment layer, for instance, within the red group, I'm only adjusting the brightness and contrast of the red portion of the color image and the green and blue are unaffected. Likewise, if I adjust this blue levels adjustment, it's only affecting the blue. It's not affecting the green and red below it. So that lets you visually adjust levels up and down, left, right, backwards and forwards, and see what's happening to the document as a result of adjusting those levels. So you can work very visually rather than working numerically. We talked about the layer style dialog box, and we applied it to a layer. You can also apply that layer style to a group. So the entire group can be set to red, green, and blue only rather than just the individual layer within it. So my workflow overall is I prepare my files for Photoshop in a TIFF format, uh, load the files into a stack of some sort, ensuring that I'm in 16-bit RGB mode, put each file into its own layer group, set the advanced blending option to select the appropriate color for that group, Red, green, and blue is obvious. With narrow band, you might guess I would also map those to red, green, and blue. And then use adjustment layers to tune the color and tone of each one of those layers individually and independently to get the color balance that I'm looking for. And voila, you have a full color image.
So layer-based non-destructive workflow is what I like to think of as a better way of working. It's fast and easy and flexible. Uh, and because of that, it lets you converge to what I feel are better results more quickly and with, with less hassle. And because you can change your mind and go back, uh, that works real well for me. If you recall, I'm impatient but persistent. So it's fast, it supports adjustment layers. It also makes star extraction simple and powerful, especially if with a tool like star exterminator that runs as a filter. And that works just beautifully on a uh, layer-based workflow. You can easily color map the same data different ways just to, to play around with different uh, color mapping options. And if you pick up additional data in the future, you can pretty easily add those. So the example data that I have to work with came from uh, shooting Orion with the uh, FSQ-106. And I have hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur at 600 seconds each, red, green, and blue at 120 seconds each processed all of those through Deep Sky Stacker uh, by loading all of the files at once. And then typically I will select the hydrogen layer that has the best score and designate that as the reference frame. So that each one of the groups is aligned to that same reference frame. And then save, in particular, the narrow band data as a 32-bit FITS file that I can then take into FITS Liberator to process those into 16-bit TIFFs. It has lots of different stretching algorithms. Uh, the one I normally use is the arcsine H, and it has controls on the histogram to adjust the black and white points. Yeah. I'll usually adjust the black point to make it dark, but not pure black. And then I'll, I'll try to find something like a double star and zoom in on that and adjust the, uh, the white level so that we, I don't lose the definition of those two stars that are close together. So that gives me six files to work with, red, green, and blue, unstretched from DSS, and then H, uh, HA03 and S2 stretched from FITS Liberator and saved as 16-bit TIFFs. So from six inputs to one output. And as I mentioned earlier, I probably have more presentation and demonstration than we'll have time to go through. Uh, all of this is already recorded and on a blog post on my website at utahdesertremote.com. Uh, and there, all four parts of the two-part series are available on that blog post. But the basic process is we'll start with the uh, red, green, and blue and do what I call a hard stretch to build this base image. Uh, and you can see from the hard stretch, the core is pretty blown out. We'll use star exterminator to remove the stars from that. Then we'll stretch that same data a second time with a light stretch, this time using the arcsine H stretch algorithm. Again, remove the stars. And this time we'll extract the stars by subtraction to create a stars only layer. And then we can then take the stars and the, the darker detail from the core, move those over to the base image and add smaller, colorful, not blown out stars. And also we can bring a little bit of the, uh, the darker detail from the core in to restore the detail there. I do tend to like, uh, it's just a matter of personal taste, uh, with objects like Orion, I tend to keep the core bright because it is bright so that it shines as being different from the rest of it. But that's, that's just the way I approach it. Then we'll go to the narrow band data. And the first thing we'll look at is an HOO mapping of the narrow band data. We'll play with a narrow band uh, Hubble palette SHO. Remove the stars from those layers with star exterminator. And then look at combining the narrow band data with the RGB stars. And because, because I've done everything to the same uh, layer alignment in DSS, and I don't crop anything anywhere along the way, I can freely move back and forth between the uh, narrow band and the broadband data. So we can go back to our, our core base image where we left off, and we can bring in some of the oxygen detail to add some of this detail around the, uh, the kind of the collar area of the uh, nebula. 
<clears throat> we can also bring in some of the hydrogen. There's a lot of rich hydrogen in the background. We can let that come through to whatever level we want it to uh, shine or not shine. Uh, we can even pick up some of the uh, detail in the sulfur because it was not blown out in the core and we can use that to bring some color and a little more detail into the core area. The last thing I would do is finish with global and local adjustments in Photoshop and then I would save this as a uh, .psb with all layers and adjustments layers intact and open that in Lightroom and Lightroom is where I would do any final color and contrast adjustments add local contrast with the uh, some presence tools like texture or clarity, rotate, and this is where I would crop because I don't know in advance if I want this as a horizontal 16 by nine for a, my computer wallpaper or a vertical 16 by 20 to print. And those are all different shapes and possibly different cropping. So I don't wanna crop anything until I know for sure the, the purpose of that image. So, this would probably be a good place before we jump into Photoshop if there's any questions. Uh, Craig, I have a question. I probably missed it, but what do you map uh, the sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen to? What colors? Well, uh, whatever colors you want. I mean, the default would be probably a Hubble palette of sulfur to red, uh, hydrogen to green and oxygen to blue. But I saw on your image that the hydrogen was red. Yes, we, I also did an HOO version. And as we go through um, the kind of the demonstration portion, we'll actually do that. So you don't map the sulfur to a completely different color? Um, generally, I do. It just depends on what the others are mapped to. I don't see any other questions on the um, chat. There's, a, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, one is the, um, uh, 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 could you run back real quick to the opening slide where we see your observatory? And while you're doing that, I wanted to remind everybody that um, uh, at the very top of the comments section, uh, you will find a uh, link to Craig's website. So if you go there, copy that down, you'll be able to get to Craig's website where he can show you that stuff. Now, back to um, that, we want to hear about your observatory thingy looking building. Okay. That's one. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that real quick. Well, this was built as a prototype for a larger building that we're in the process of getting ready to start construction on. Uh, that will house 16 piers. Uh, we built this as a prototype just to test out the construction methods uh, and the control system. So this is a, it's fully functional uh, using a, uh, a steel master uh, Quonset hut style building on a steel I-beam to open and close. Uh, got a gate, gate opener back here that does the opening and closing. Uh, that's all connected to a weather system so that if the wind picks up or it gets a drop of rain on it, it'll automatically close. Um, okay. Got a, we, we do have a, a sky quality meter and just getting a seeing monitor online during the last maybe two days. Um, but when the, uh, when the moon's not in the way, we're getting a you know solid Bortle two readings in the 21.94 range on the sky quality meter, and so far our our uh, seeing readings have been kind of in the the mid ones, uh, one to two arc seconds, uh, but I still need to do some fine tuning on that. Are you mentioned you're going to have multiple peers? Is this a group or is this going to be a commercial operation? This will be a commercial operation. So you can, you'll be able to rent a location where we'll provide power and high speed internet. Uh, and you put your equipment on our concrete foundation. Uh, in the prototype, we've got about 6,000 pounds of cement buried below grade. And then there's a 24 inch concrete sauna tube riser that comes up through the floor, but not connected to the floor. So we'll have 16 of those in the large observatory. 
uh, one of the, the key factors was trying to find some place that had dark skies, um, access to water and power, and especially high-speed internet. We were fortunate to find this. How far from civilization are you? It uh, depends on where you start and what you call civilization. Uh, it's about 60 miles north of St. George, Utah, or about 40 miles or so west of Cedar City. Okay. And uh, our daughter and her husband uh, will be living there as full-time caretakers. So we will have people on site uh, full-time. Cool. Thank you very much. Now, uh, reminder that the, the links to the website are there at the beginning, at the top of the uh, comment section. And let's get back to the program. Okay. So I think when we last looked at Photoshop, we were getting ready to start the, uh, the demonstration portion. And the first thing we want to do is load our, our red, green, and blue base image and do a hard stretch. Now, to do the hard stretch, we actually have to load each layer individually. So instead of using the scripts load files into a stack, I'm going to just go to File, Open, and go to the, uh, the Layer Open dialog and navigate to the folder where those files are living. And we want to grab the red, green, and blue. And if I select all three and click open, in this case, rather than opening these as a stack, it's just going to open them one by one as individual documents. And to do the, the quick and easy hard stretch, which I, I frequently do just to kind of get going with something, uh, you have to open it this way. That if you, if I even rename this background layer to something else, then Photoshop won't give me the option. But we now have our red, green, and blue on the tabs at the top. Each one's an individual document. And as I mentioned, I always work these in order. So I'm going to start with the red one. And I want to go to image mode. In this case, it's already an RGB color document, but it's 32 bits per channel. I want to change it to 16 bits per channel. And because I haven't done anything with this background layer, I get this dialog box where I can choose a method. And the method that will give me a nice, quick, hard stretch is equalize histogram. And just click OK. And there's our, our red layer, what will be our red layer, with a nice hard stretch on it. So let's go to the green. Again, we'll go to image mode, 16 bits per channel. And it will give us the dialog box to choose equalize histogram. Click OK. Now we'll go to blue and do the same thing. Image mode. 16 bits per channel and equalize histogram. This is a, it's a pretty blunt instrument using the equalize histogram. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it just plays havoc with the image, but it's quick and easy and it's worth trying. So now that we have our red, green, and blue is 16 bit, we need to get them all into one document. Now there is an easy way to do that with the move tool. And I'm going to start with green and I'm going to tap and actually before I do that, let's just rename this. I'll double click on background. Name this green so that we don't get confused later. I'll go to the blue. Double click on the word background. Type blue. And just to be consistent, we'll go to the uh, red channel, double click on the background layer, and name it red. Now I can go to the green, tap V for the move tool, and it turns into a, uh, an arrow. And what I want to do is just click and drag 
easiest way in the world to copy from one document to another. Uh, there's a little trick to it though. You click in the image area and hold the mouse button down and drag up to the tab of the file that you want to copy it to. Keep the mouse button pressed down, pull your mouse down into the image area. And since we want this to paste aligned to the same way it was to start with, I need to press and hold the shift key. Now I can release the mouse button, release the shift key, and you can see we've now added the green layer on top of the red layer. It feels a bit like a, a dance the first time you do it, but after you've done it a few times, it's really quite easy. Now we'll just go to the uh, blue document. Again, click, drag up to the red tab, drag down into the image, press and hold the shift key, release the mouse. Now we have red, green, and blue all lined up. And I'm just going to go ahead and close the documents that we're not using. So close the blue and no, we don't need to save it. Close the green. No, I don't need to save it because these are we're really just kind of throwaway moves. You can probably guess what I'm going to do at this point. I'm going to tap for each layer. I'll select each layer, tap Control G to put that layer in a group. Do the same thing with green. Do the same thing with red. So if I want to, we could put a levels adjustment in here and, and tweak these. Uh, for this one, we can really just jump straight into to color mapping. I'll go to the top group now. And rather than going to layer and blending options, you can also double click in this area to the right of the name. If I double click there, it will bring up the advanced blending dialog box. And this is the, the blue group. So we want to turn off red and green, leave just blue. Go to the red layer, or I'm sorry, the green layer double click to pull up that dialog box. I mentioned this is an, an older laptop and it's kind of huffing and puffing tonight. So there's the green, we just simply turn off red and blue. And you notice we don't have to do anything with red because this bottom layer has all three red, green, and blue. We're really simply replacing the green with this layer and the blue with this layer. At this point, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you just flattened this file uh, because we haven't really made any creative decisions so far. It's just been kind of turning the crank on the process. But since we're talking about non-destructive, let's make this into a smart object. And to do that, I'll select all of the layers and all of the groups, and I can go to Layer, Smart Objects, Convert to Smart Object. A smart object is like flattening or merging layers in that it gives you, it resolves everything and gives you what that layer looks like when it's all merged together, but it's keeping all of the components intact. So a smart object has a, a little badge icon on the layer thumbnail that tells us that that's a smart object. And it's a little small and hard to see, but it's right there. And the beauty of that is twofold. One, if I double click on that, it will reopen all of the original data that was in there, no matter how complicated it was, and let me make edits. And then when I close that, it will save it back into the smart object with the changes intact. The other thing it does is it supports smart filters. So we mentioned earlier that star exterminator is a filter. If I run that filter, on a smart object, it will run as a smart filter. Now that'll take a few minutes for this document. So rather than doing that, I'm just going to abandon what we've done so far and we'll go someplace where I have already done the work. There's the base image with the smart object and you'll notice that the smart filters show below it. And if I had run more than one filter they would show in succession with the first one at the bottom and then the middle and, and so forth. You can change the order of the filters. 
if you want, if you need to, you can turn individual filters on and off, or we can turn the whole smart filter on and off. So if I turn it off, that's with the stars intact. And if I turn it back on, that's filtering out the stars. So, you know, non-destructive, uh, easy to, to change our mind. If we want to go back and adjust the color balance of this, you just double click on the uh, smart object, make your changes, and when it saves, it will put everything back into the smart object. So we said we were going to stretch the, the data twice. For the second one, for the arc sign age, we do want to load red, green, and blue into a layers. So for that, we will choose scripts. And it'd be nice if I picked the right. Load files into stack. And now again, we want to browse. Pick our red, green, and blue. Click OK. Click OK. And again, now Photoshop will go through and load the red, green, and blue as individual layers within one document. And these will be unstretched. And just incidentally, if you're actually doing this for yourself, if you open red, green, and blue twice, uh, the Photoshop may get confused and not want to open the same document more than once. So that's one of the reasons I needed to save the individual red, green, and blue and close those before I open them here as a stack. Uh, if you copy them into something and save it with a new name, you won't have that problem. Let's look at our layer or our image mode. And we are RGB, but we're 32 bits. And we want to get this 16 bit. So I'll change to 16 bit. And this time it just says, do I want to merge these three layers? Nope, still don't want to merge them. And because this is kind of a throwaway process, uh, I'm just after the stars and some of the detail in the core. I'm not even going to put these into groups. I'm just going to very quickly go into the uh, layer blending dialog and map these to red, green, and blue. So the first one, yeah. Notice that my order is is wrong here. And it, that would probably trip me up somewhere. So I'm going to put them red, green, and blue just because that's the way I'm used to working. Open up the, open up the blue first. And again, it, it shouldn't matter uh, because all three have all three. But for the blue, I'll turn off the uh, red and green. For the green, I'll turn off and I'm double clicking out here to the right of the file name rather than going to layer uh, blending options, layer style blending options. Turn off blue and red to get green. And now we have a, a dark but color image. And I need to make a couple monochrome copies of this to, to follow the, uh, the arc sign H method. So, I will first I'll do a shift control alternate E. And that's the thing that merges all visible into a single layer. And now I can desaturate this and quick shortcut for that is shift control U to desaturate a layer. And then I need to make another copy of this control J. And all these instructions are on Mark Shelley's website. Uh, I am kind of going through this fairly quickly. This top layer I want to put into divide blending mode. That Photoshop has, remember I said lots of ways for layers to interact and blending mode is one of those. The default is normal. There's a group that generally darken what's below. There's a group that uses this to lighten. There's a group that will both darken and lighten. There's some specialty calculations and then there's just hue, just saturation, just color and just luminosity. So for this, we want the top layer to be in divide blending mode. And then the middle layer, I will put that into a group and I'll put the whole group into multiply blending mode. 
So in effect, we're multiplying by something and then we're dividing by that same thing. And that thing is just a monochrome copy of what's below. Now I can go to the layer inside the multiply group. And here's where I would add in a, a curves adjustment layer. And Mark Shelley has kindly provided some, some presets that have various strengths of the arc sine H stretch. For this one, the arc sine 100 works pretty well. And that gives me a more gentle stretch. You can see some of the detail in the core, but the real advantage is that it preserves the color and the, keeps the stars as small as possible. And you will notice if you zoom out, it starts to look real raggedy and ugly. Uh, it's when you zoom in, it will suddenly smooth out. If you make a, a stamped copy of this, it will come out smooth. It's really just the way Photoshop looks at it. So at this point, we, I said we want to remove the stars because what we're really after here are the stars. So I will do a shift control alternate E again to create a stamped copy. And let's go ahead and name this one uh, stretched. And then I'll duplicate this again. And this is the layer I want to remove the stars from. So I would go to filter star exterminator and run star exterminator on this layer to remove the stars, leaving the, uh, the starred layer intact below. And again, we've already done that. So this is what you'll get. You'll have the star, starred layer that's stretched. And then on top, where we ran star exterminator, we'll have a starless layer. To get just the stars, we need to subtract the starless layer from the starry layer. And I can turn that. That's what the starry layer looks like. That's the starless layer. Again, if we go to our friend, the blending options, and let's choose subtract, that lets us see just the stars. But remember, we're just looking at this through a subtract mode. We're seeing it, but it's not really there. And we want to preserve this. So I will do a shift control alternate E one more time. And that will create a stamped layer of just the stars. And I'm going to label this stars. So now we have a stars layer. And I'll go back to my starless layer and put it back into normal blending mode. These are really the only two things we want from this document. The rest of it will throw away. And what we want to do is put those into our base layer on top of this starless image. So to do that, I've selected both layers. Again, we'll go to the Move tool, click, drag, drag into the image area, hold the Shift key, release the mouse key. Now I'll just quickly throw the stars into a group with Control G and put that group into linear add or linear dodge blending mode. And let's turn off the starless layer. So there's our base layer without stars and with nice, small, colorful stars as opposed to the, the big bloated blown out stars that it started with. If we want to bring some of the detail into the core area, I can go to our starless layer. And what I want to do initially is just hide everything and reveal just some of this. So I can go to layer, layer mask, hide all. And that created a layer mask. You can see the thumbnail where the layer mask is next to the layer icon. And we can see that it's filled with black. And what we want to do is just grab the brush tool, tap B for the brush tool, tap the D key to ensure we have foreground and background colors. And we want white because we want to reveal some of this. And we want to do it at a fairly low opacity. And you can tap a number key that if we look up in here, you can see the opacity is at 10%. If I tap the five key, it would go to 50%. The zero key would go to 100%. Let's just start at 10%. And with a nice big soft brush, we'll just paint with white on that layer. And what we're doing is just putting some of the detail from the light stretch 
over top of the, the darker stretch. If I went too far, if I want to take back some of that, all I have to do is tap the X key to switch to black and painting black on that layer mask will hide some of what I just revealed with white. So that gives us our base RGB image. And at this point, we would be ready to, to dig into the uh, narrow band data. So let me close our light stretched image. Narrow band data. I know this is what the, the title said we were going to do. We'll go to the scripts, load files into stack. And this time, when we browse, we want to pick up the narrow band files. So we'll grab hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Click OK. Click OK. And as we did before, Photoshop is going to load these three layers into one document with each one on its own layer. So we'll have a layer of hydrogen, a layer of oxygen, and a layer of sulfur. And you can probably guess already what we're going to do. We're going to first we'll organize those because just like I like red, green, and blue organized in a certain order, I, I always like my narrow band lined up with hydrogen on the bottom and sulfur on the top. It doesn't matter what order you have them in. That's just the order that I'm used to working in. And if I work in the same order all the time, it just keeps me from getting confused. So it's almost done loading. And again, the odd thing, you never know for sure what order it's going to actually load the files in. I'm not sure how it decides. Uh, it does have, it looks like hydrogen on the bottom, but we've got sulfur in the middle. So I'll just click on the sulfur layer, and drag it up to the top of the layer stack. So we have sulfur on top. Tap Control G successively for each one of these to drop them into a group. Let's check to see our image mode. And we are grayscale, but 16 bits. So let's convert to RGB color. No, we don't want to merge. And if we want to just quickly throw a levels adjustment layer in here to maybe pull down the, the dark level a little bit, we can do that with, I'll start with sulfur, turn off the visibility of that group, go to the oxygen layer, add a levels adjustment, do the same thing, turn off the visibility, go to the hydrogen, throw an adjustment layer in here, darken this one a little bit. Now we can do some, some color mapping. And let's start with an HOO. I'll turn on the oxygen. And you're probably already guessing. I'm going to go to the advanced blending options. HOO, we want hydrogen for red, green and blue for oxygen. Oxygen is currently all three red, green, and blue. Just turn off the red. And we have an HOO image just like that. If we decide we do now, we really want to try, maybe we want to try an HSO. I can turn the sulfur layer on, bring up its advanced blending dialog box. For HSO, we would have sulfur mapped to green. So we'll turn off red and blue. And now we have an HSO image. If we want a Hubble palette, SHO, I'll go back to the uh, sulfur first. And naturally, we want for, for SHO, we want red from sulfur. And then from the oxygen, Right now, we have both blue and green turned on. We really want just blue for oxygen. And we're going to let the hydrogen shine through with green. So we'll bring up this dialog box for the oxygen, turn off the blue. And there we have a Hubble palette, SHO. So just by 
changing those, those controls and the advanced blending, you can move back and forth quickly from one to the other. Okay. Typically at this point, yeah. Can we, can we ask a couple of questions? Okay. Okay, Matthew says, uh, what do you use for enhancing fine detail? And have you ever used the camera off filters? I have, uh, and in particular, if you use the uh, smart object for the camera raw, to feed into the camera raw filter, it's non-destructive from the standpoint that you can create a, the smart object from those layers, open it in the camera raw filter, adjust clarity, contrast, uh, texture, whatever. Uh, negative dehaze, incidentally, really brings out fine nebulosity in, in light areas. Um, when you close the camera raw filter, it applies those filters to the smart object, but if you change your mind on something, you can just double click on the smart object on that camera raw filter and go back and revisit the settings again. So you enhance detail using the camera raw approach? Sometimes I do, sometimes I use the uh, high pass filter. Uh, it just depends on the image. And with the high pass filter, do you use the starless image with the high pass filter? Typically, yes. Um, yeah, typically at this point, I would, uh, with narrow band, I almost always do the starless by layer. So I would duplicate each one of these starred layers and run star exterminator on each one of those, which would give me this result where I have for each, each element, both a starred and a starless. So you can you could do a high pass filter by uh, by element or in total. And do you ever go to the more traditional uh, color scheme? Yeah. For the Hubble palette. Yeah. And if you do that, how do you do it by adjusting the histograms? You can you can do it by adjusting the uh, histograms within these to to move you closer. Um, this is kind of a pure uh, SHO, and because Orion has so much hydrogen, especially in the area around it, it just comes out very green. So sometimes I embrace the green and just go with a green image. Uh, other times I will go on top of the top layer or the top layer group and add either color balance adjustment layers or hue saturation, and you can you know, start to massage those colors and move them around. In fact, so, one of the one of the videos in that set on my website uh, spends a little bit more time delving into the different ways of color mapping and then adjusting the uh, color mapping. Uh, what do you do about the star residues for a star exterminator? Um, I've got a couple different approaches. I don't think I've got a video specifically on that. Um, most of the time, it, it, usually you can take care of some of the, the big ones with the uh, spot healing brush. I don't like to do that because it is destructive, uh, but sometimes you just have to. Uh, most of the time what you get are smudges, and the smudges are really kind of a lack of noise and texture, and you can fix those non-destructively by adding a, uh, a noise layer and then painting, uh, you know, revealing that noise layer in an overlay over the image and that that hides the uh, noise or hides the smudge. Okay, I think we're all set for now. Okay. So I know we're running long on time. So just very briefly, what I would do here is take my narrow band data that we have created starless images from and Again, since we haven't cropped anything, we can just plop that into this image, our kind of our base image. And I just close the group. And whatever layer you're on, when you drag something over, what you drag over will go on top of that. So what I want to do is select the uh, kind of the light stretched image from our base image, go back to the narrow band. I'll just grab all three layers tap the uh, V for the move tool, 
drag it over to our base image, drag back into the image area, press and hold the shift key, release the mouse. And now we have our SHO narrowband image with RGB stars that we can, of course, turn on and off. Kind of the, the last trick here is if we want to use the narrowband data to enhance our base image. So to do that, let's just quickly turn off those layer groups to get back to the original base image. And we saw there was a lot of oxygen detail in the narrowband in this area around the, the, the main nebula. So let's turn on our oxygen group, but we need to make a couple changes. First, right now it's mapped to just blue and we probably want it to be both blue and green to pick up cyan. So I'll just turn the green channel back on. Green and blue make cyan and that's kind of a usual color for oxygen. The other thing I wanna do is change this group from its normal blending mode to lighten blending mode. And what that will do, any place the oxygen layer is brighter than what's before, below it, it will add that detail. Anywhere it's darker, it won't change it. And then we can just visually adjust this by going to the levels adjustment layer within the oxygen group. If we want to turn that up, if we want to kind of throttle down the dark area so it doesn't show up so much in the background. Uh, again, we can visually play with the balance. And usually once the stars are taken out, we have a lot more freedom to even move this, uh, this white levels adjustment. So that added some nice oxygen detail. We can do the same thing with, uh, with I'm sorry, that added oxygen. We can add hydrogen. This time we do need to change the uh, advanced blending options on hydrogen because now we do want just the red and we can't depend on it just being the default of what's left over. So we'll turn off green and blue. And again, we'll make this group lighten blending mode so that we're just letting it lighten the image below. And again, we may want to play with the balance by going to that hydrogen group levels adjustment. We can make the hydrogen more or less dominant in the background. We can move the black point in and out if we want to you know, keep the background more dark or more saturated. The last piece we might add is from the sulfur. And here we're gonna go a little bit different direction. On the sulfur, it adds some nice detail and color in the core. So rather than lighten, in this case, we'll use darken blending mode. And we don't wanna do it, at least to my eye, I don't wanna do it everywhere. I wanna do it just in the core area. So again, I'll go to layer, layer mask, hide all. And that gives me a layer mask that's black and hides everything. Tap B for the brush tool. And then I can Tap X to make sure white is my foreground. We're at 10% opacity. And I can just paint some of this, what's now cyan from the uh, sulfur. So there's kind of a finished image. Uh, you know, I might play with overall color balance uh, to adjust the color balance, saturation, contrast, whatever to to tweak this image into its final Photoshop form, and then save this as a .psb file, which is the uh, Photoshop's large uh, document format. And it saves with all of these layers and adjustments intact, even the smart object for the original base layer. So I can come back to this later today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, change my mind, change how much hydrogen, maybe I don't want hydrogen at all, uh, you know, whatever the changes are, if I want a starless image, I can just turn the stars off. Uh, you've got lots of flexibility to do whatever you want. And I know I went long, but that pretty much brought us to the, uh, the end of what I had prepared in Photoshop. So, Thank probably... You. Thank you very much. Um, Eric, do you see any more questions over there? I think we're good.
No, I think we're all set. Okay, cool. Um, can I, can well, you know, I you? have not used Photoshop all that much. I use it for touching up stuff like that, but it's it's not my basic workhorse anymore. Uh, and a lot of those tools were available to me way back then. Uh, they are very powerful tools, and there's a lot to be said for not destroying your data as you go. Every time you process an image, you're changing something in the image. You're changing the data, and you don't necessarily want to do that. You want to be able to go back to it, and, and, and this is a good way to be doing that. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I think we're about to call it a night. Don't forget that we have some... Uh, uh, Arno is waiting for you to send in your shots of the solar system. And um, Rory is waiting for you to go on over and get Terry's tarantula data and process it and send it into him so he can show it off for everybody. And we can have a workshop program on that coming up later. Uh, so we've got those things coming up for you. And we do have lots of other people signing up. Please sign up yourself. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new to the channel and uh, like the channel and uh, we'll be back next week with Matt Penn. So um, hope to see you all again next week. Thank you very much. And Tim, thanks for taking care of us today. Terry, thanks also. Uh, so it's time to check out. Bye everybody.